Hi, and welcome back to the Save It For Parts channel. In this video, I'm doing a few upgrades to my S-Band tracking satellite dish. Now, this is a DIY dish that I put together using a former television satellite dish, specifically a motorized mount unit that was originally supposed to go on top of an RV, camper, uh, some kind of vehicle. This is a traveler model made by Weingard. It's a regular looking rooftop television dish, but on the bottom it has this motorized mount that can rotate it in azimuth and change the elevation of the dish. For a vehicle, for a camper, this is useful when you park somewhere in a new location and you want to aim it at a TV satellite and then you can just start watching football instead of enjoying wherever you are on vacation. For my purposes I have hacked this dish to aim at other satellites and in fact aim and track moving low earth orbit satellites. I have a previous video where I showed how I modified this dish to use computer control, how I replaced the existing KU band L and B feed at the front with an S band feed. S-band is used more for scientific satellites, weather satellites. There are some military and government satellites that use this part of the microwave frequency band. Basically, there are just more interesting things at this part of the radio spectrum that I want to look at. So again, in this video, I'm taking this existing dish that I've shown in a couple prior videos and doing some upgrades. I want it a little bit higher. I want some better cable management. I want better power supplies to my amplifier and filter circuits that live on the dish. And I'd like to make a few other adjustments both to my program and my software processing so hopefully we can get some different satellites and we can get some better imagery from some of the satellites that we've tried before. So I'm doing a few modifications to my S-band dish. I've got this flipped over and the bottom panel removed. I was going to put a little power adapter or buck converter in here kind of attached to the brain of the outdoor unit and this provides 16 to 18 volts. This thing wants 12 to 24 volts so hopefully that's in the right range and then that was going to provide 5 volts out to the first low noise amplifier that's in my RF chain. I realized I don't really need this thing at all though because there's already three wires that come uh, basically from the indoor unit up to the roof, up to the dish. Uh, there are three jacks on the outside here and all three of those wires go through the center of rotation on the dish so I could just have the power supply down below run it through the coax cable, hook that up through the rotation mechanism and have it come out and then feed that into the amplifier. So we'll do that, we'll save this for some other project. While I'm up here I'm also raising the antenna a little bit just to avoid an issue where it flops down, uh, stows itself and kind of smashes the uh, arm and the feed into the ground. So now it's up a little higher, if it accidentally stows that's fine. It also gets it off the roof, gets a little less interference from other stuff low to the ground or low to the roof here. Also gets it up out of the snow, so a couple reasons to put it up on the milk crates here. And of course, I am using the time-honored engineering tradition of milk crates and zip ties. So my current RF radio chain is in from the helical feed into this first amplifier. This is a mini circuits L to S band amplifier. Then it's going to this wide band amplifier and then down to the SDR. Now I'm going to try inserting a filter right in between the two amplifiers. That's going to be a S-band filter because I'm mainly wanting to use this dish with S-band. It works for L-band but I have other antennas for that and I'm mostly interested in improving my S-band reception. The downside of this S-band filter is it will not fit inside the arm of the dish. I was hoping to put everything in there to keep it a little bit more waterproof. So that means that all the filters and amplifiers are going to have to go I guess underneath and then Maybe I'll just have to put them in a Ziploc bag or something. That's not ideal for waterproofing, but I guess it'll kind of work. So now we're going to go from our helical feed in to first stage amplifier. That's externally powered. Then to the filter, and this doesn't say which end is in and which is out, so I'm hoping it doesn't matter. Then that goes to the second stage amplifier and then down to the SDR. And this amplifier is going to be powered from the SDR. So five volts coming up uh, through the antenna wire from the bias T. Getting those surplus warehouse stairs for the roof, that was such a good idea. These make it so much easier to do antenna nonsense on the garage. I picked up some more plastic pallets to go up on the roof of the garage. You can find wood pallets everywhere for free, but these things cost like nine or ten dollars and they last a lot longer than the wood ones. The only downside is they really build up a static charge when I walk around on them. But they're a good way to protect a tar and gravel roof. You're not really supposed to walk on it, especially in the summer you could drive the gravel down through the tar. So these just distribute the weight a little better. 
course I had to decorate the satellite dish a little bit, even if nobody will see it most of the time. I'm always great at planning ahead, so I built this precarious milk crate stack immediately before the biggest blizzard of the season. Last night we had 8 inches of wet heavy snow and winds up to 40 miles an hour, so somehow my dish and structural milk crate stack are still here. So I guess that is a testament to the structural strength of milk crates and zip ties. I did aim the dish away from the prevailing wind and I did put it upright like this so the snow would not accumulate on the dish surface. I parked it upright once before during a storm like this and it just got overloaded with snow. Well, my dish survived that blizzard and it is still working just fine. I'm still getting pretty decent signal, although I'm still having issues with the meridian flip. I thought I had that ironed out, but I'm still having a problem where when the dish crosses zero degrees north or 360 degrees going the other direction, it wants to flip around and go completely in the other direction. So people sometimes ask why I don't use Sat Dumps recorder or scheduling system to automate some of my uh, satellite captures and honestly I don't know how. I have, I have kind of mixed luck with Sat Dump when I try to use it with my Hack RF1, it just crashes and I think it might be because this is an older laptop, it's a little bit uh, slower, and it just doesn't have the processing power to do anything fancy. So when I try to use SatDump with the HackRF, when I try to uh, even try to refresh SatDump to look at the HackRF, or I try to start it to just look at the radio spectrum, it crashes every time. I also have issues trying to process DMSP on the laptop with SAT dump. I basically have to process the baseband on the laptop, then FTP the frame over to my main computer, and then I run that through SAT dump on my desktop, which is a brand new computer, pretty beefy processor, and that has no issues. It doesn't crash. And yes, the SAT dump developers have an excellent technical and development chat on something called Matrix, which also never quite works for me. Anytime I try to log into the Matrix chat, it just sits there trying to unencrypt stuff for hours. So I basically don't use that either. They do have a Discord as well, but I have the attention span for about 75% of my own Discord, and I basically never check any other Discords. Basically, my process works well enough for me, and I'm always so busy trying to improve and tweak my hardware that I just have not had the time or attention span to work on the software end of things. So this setup is really good at getting DMSP, even on distant passes. We're only at four degrees elevation here, and we're getting a decent signal from uh, DMSP F17. This is a southbound pass, and in a previous video I said DMSP 17 and 18 don't transmit in the clear on southbound passes, but it looks like they actually do, at least for part of the pass. We'll see at what point in the orbit does this cut back over to the encrypted signal. Might be able to actually uh, decode some of this, but it's still very far north and it might be a questionable signal for decoding. And my remote desktop connection crashed. I've been having connection issues with this. I'm not sure what the deal is. Fortunately, it looks like everything's still running and it's still recording. I just lost my connection to the local computer. And there we go. I did have to crank up the VGA gain to even see it, but we've just switched from unencrypted signal down here to encrypted signal. And we're losing the signal because the satellite is starting to drop below the horizon for me. Unfortunately, that signal was not quite strong enough to actually decode it, so I don't think we can get a pretty picture out of that pass. All right, so now DMSP-17 is staying encrypted far north of where it usually unencrypts. So um, usually these unencrypt somewhere around the southern end of the Great Lakes, but it is still in encryption mode. I wonder if the timing is just screwed up on one of these satellites. It just adds to the mystery of this DMSP satellite system. So next I'm going to try the Japanese Solar B or High Node satellite. This is similar to SatGus in certain ways, mainly that it downlinks to a far away location and I can only catch pieces of the pass. So I'm looking at a Far East pass, for me, where it will be dumping its data to Wallops Island on the east coast of the US. Hopefully I'll catch enough of the radio signal from that Far Eastern pass that I can decode something. My remote desktop is just getting more and more glitchy here. It used to work really well, but lately it's just been out of control on glitches and crashes. Yeah, that's definitely not a strong enough signal to get any data from high node Solar B. Honestly, the 2250 megahertz filter doesn't seem to be making a huge difference in this setup. 
I think it works just as well to have the microcircuits LNA and then the wideband LNA sandwiched together without the filter in the middle. All right, now here's another interesting one. This is the Coriolis satellite. This is a wind measurement satellite, and various sources online say that this doesn't broadcast anymore on S-band, but it sure looks like I'm getting something on the correct frequency. Sat dump seems to be getting something from that Coriolis data. Sadly, there doesn't seem to be any actual data in that transmission. It's just these kind of single pixel wide images of static. And now DMSP 17 is right back to its regular behavior, unencrypting right around 40 degrees north latitude, the same as before. I have no idea what's going on with these satellites. It's like they're doing something different on every pass now. While playing around with the images downloaded from the DMSP satellites, I noticed that there were some distortions or kind of duplicated features. So some of the images had kind of a weird ghosting effect. Now this isn't in every image, but it was in enough of them that it was pretty annoying, especially when it's in the colorized infrared visible overlay images, the ones that kind of look the prettiest. I talked to Nate on my Discord channel who's been doing some processing of DMSP images and he came up with a way of throwing these into GIMP, which is a free Photoshop alternative, basically deleting every other row of imagery pasting the image back onto itself and then adjusting it because for some reason the even and odd rows are off by a little bit. Now this is something I've run into with my own code when I used my Tailgater miniature radio telescope to do scans of the sky. My left scans and my right scans did not always line up. So there might be something like that going on with either the DMSP satellite or with the way that sat dump processes these DMSP dumps. Anyway, using Nate's technique, we have some nicer and prettier DMSP images. These now have a lot more resolution. They look much less fuzzy. This looks much better, and the quality is a lot better. This is actually a little bit better quality than some of the NOAA satellites, which is nice. I had started to write off DMSP before as kind of having low quality images because I was having an issue like this every time I tried to download it, and I didn't zoom in close enough to realize what was going on until Nate looked at it for me. I can't remember if I mentioned in a prior video, I have also hacked the firmware of the dish even further than I had it hacked before. In some prior videos, I had a elevation limit of about 15 degrees. The dish did not want to go below 15 degrees. And this is kind of built in. This is a factory setting. They're assuming that you have other stuff on the roof of your camper, like air conditioning units, roof racks, storage. And if your dish goes below 15 degrees and is spinning around on top of a camper, it might run into stuff. I'm using it just out in clear air, so I want it to go all the way down to zero degrees. I want this thing to be able to aim at the horizon. So to do that, for the WineGuard Traveler, I had to go into the non-volatile storage menu in my firmware and change the minimum elevation setting to zero degrees. If anyone's interested in that, I will have links to the GitHub page that I put all my software on. You can go down to the description, link over to GitHub, and you can see some of my notes on how to make some of those changes and how to use some of my software or your own custom software to interface with an antenna like this. That about wraps up the mods and improvements that I wanted to do on the S-band dish, at least for now. I've raised it up higher, I've improved the power feed to the first amplifier, we've tried the cavity filter. I don't think I like the cavity filter. It doesn't seem to provide any real benefit. I've looked at other satellites with the same setup. I looked at some of the standard NOAA weather satellites, and I don't see any difference with or without that cavity filter, even on kind of distant passes below 15 degrees, it comes in about the same strength with or without the filter. So I might just pull that thing out. It doesn't seem to really provide any benefit. What else did I do here? I messed around with the firmware. I did some cable management. I would still like to figure out a sat dump for more than just processing the images. I'd like to be able to use it for receiving and antenna control and especially scheduling. If there's a satellite coming over at 3 a.m., I don't necessarily want to wake up, power up all my dishes, power up the laptop, babysit everything through the pass. If I could automate that, have sat dump, turn on the SDR at a certain time, turn on the satellite rotor, turn on the bias T, download the pass, process the pass, and have everything ready for me when I wake up, that would be great. I did try some of the nightly builds on my laptop and they won't even run. So that laptop is maybe a little too old for the very latest unstable versions of sat dump. Now at this point, I am kind of running out of ideas for S-band satellites. Uh, three videos ago, this S-band thing was new, exciting. It was a big challenge. It had taken me all year to get to the point of having a good, reliable, automatically tracking S-band antenna. And now that I do, 
I don't know what to look at. We've looked at Noah, we've looked at DMSP, we've tried to look at high node, the dish isn't big enough. I've tried Coriolis and CloudSat and some other things that seem to just send down filler or telemetry on S-band. Anyway, if anybody has suggestions for a cool S-band satellite that I could look at, then uh, please let me know and I will check it out. If you're interested in more details about how I built the S-band dish, I will link to the prior videos down in the description, and you can go through my satellite playlist for videos of other projects like this that I've done, and then of course you can always like and subscribe so you don't miss my future satellite shenanigans. Thanks to my Patreon supporters who help make this channel possible. Thank you to everyone out there for watching, and we'll see you next time.